Okay. Why don't we go get why don't we get started? Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce. I'm George Rutherford from the Institute for Global Health Sciences and the uh, Department of Epidemiology and uh, Biostatistics. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Adithya uh, Katamanchi. Adithya is a uh, uh, is long known to us in infectious disease epidemiology as a uh, as a major player in um, uh, in tuberculosis and related research. Um, Adithya is a candidate for our uh, open uh, FTE um, that will be associated with the Center for Pandemic um, uh, Pandemic Readiness and Response, or how it, however it ends up being named. Adithya is currently a professor in residence step one in the Department of Medicine. He received his undergraduate degree from Duke in uh, public policy. Uh, he uh, attended UCSF for medical school residency completed a fellowship in pulmonary and critical care med medicine with a uh, research emphasis in tuberculosis. And he also received uh, a master of advanced studies disease, disease degree um, with a concentration in implementation and dissemination science from, uh, from our department. Uh, Adithya has held uh, a number of, uh, of jobs uh, at UCSF, but moving up in the uh, in the tuberculosis uh, arena in particular. Uh, he was the co-director for the UCSF Implementation Science Training Program for a number of years. He's a core faculty member in the Center for Vulnerable Population. He holds a, um, a joint appointment in epidemiology and biostatistics and is the co-director of the PRIZE Center. Adithya has been a, uh, a exceptionally successful uh, and he teaches in the implementation science curriculum uh, extensively. Adithya has been a very successful uh, NIH um, uh, investigator with uh, pretty much continuous funding, uh, and um, has you know exilian publications as as one would expect um, in keeping with his Duke heritage. So um, with that, let me turn it over to uh, to uh, Dr. Katamanchi will be speaking on uh, using implementation science to improve the quality of tuberculosis care. Aditya, thanks for joining us. Great, um, thanks George for that uh, introduction and um, thanks for inviting me to talk today. And thanks also for all of you for joining on a uh, short notice. It's great to see uh, so many people on and uh, uh, so many familiar faces. Um, so I wanted to, um, talk about some of my work today, and I'm going to focus on sort of one main project, but then sort of give you a sense of the overall work that I do as well. Um, you know, pandemic preparedness really is, is we, as I think about this topic, is really sort of critical for global health. Um, TB was actually the leading infectious cause of death prior to COVID-19, and many will say kind of the silent pandemic that's been going on and sort of not addressed for really sort of thousands of years. TB mortality actually increased for the first time in more than a decade in 2021. And as you can see on the graph there, after sort of declining steadily over the last 15 years, you see an uptake uh, both in um, you know, estimated number of deaths and sort of the death rate from, um, from TB overall, and you know, uh, both in people with and without, uh, living with and without HIV. And you know, when you think through the reasons, um, you know, there's clearly been large disruptions in health services. Um, these have been quite pronounced. Uh, these both include sort of staffing shortages, but also just, you know, closures of health centers and clinics, um, restrictions and abilities of people to travel to get, uh, uh, to get care, sort of reducing their access. But also I think what's critical is that there's been just a huge exacerbation in, this, in social determinants. These are things like food insecurity, you know, poverty, malnutrition, that are really also drivers of the TB epidemic. And so I think as, you know, Pai and Madhu Pai and um, you know, folks at the WHO like Somia Sominathan uh, argued, um, you know, the, the, the thing that we really need to do to turn around sort of TV and make progress is to first sort of end the kind of COVID-19 pandemic and then be better prepared sort of for future pandemics in addition to sort of investing more in the silent pandemic of TB. And I think this could be said to be true for you know, not just TB, but uh, I would guess that if you look at, you know, uh, other things, whether it's uh, infectious diseases or non-communicable diseases like, you know, diabetes or cancer, you're going to see similar trends um, in sort of uh, in uh, impact on in terms of deaths and sort of mortality uh, as a result of uh, pandemic-related disruptions. Sorry, my slides aren't there. We go. Um, so one of the areas we focus on is sort of case detection. Um, 
What I've shown on the slide here is a, a cascade of care figure. This, is, this happens to be from India, but similar cascade analyses have been done in many countries and regions of the world and all tell sort of the same story. Um, at the left side of the graph is kind of the estimated number of prevalent sort of TB cases, again, this case in India. And this is sort of what happens to them as they kind of go through the cascade. And you can see there's sort of a large drop off initially for just the, the people who actually reach a TB diagnostic center followed by further drop-offs after those who are diagnosed with TB, who are then registered for treatment, who then complete treatment and then actually have recurrence-free survival. So in the end, you know, less than 40% of those, uh, of, of everyone who's estimated to have TB actually sort of are cured uh, uh, of the disease. And you can see here um, in, the, in the, the, the largest gaps are in this kind of pre-treatment phase, right? These are prior to sort of being registered for treatment. That's where the biggest losses occur, right? And these reflect, you know, failures to access care as well as to sort of diagnose and link people to treatment once they do access TB diagnostic centers. So that's sort of my overall research program has really sort of um, grown to sort of address this challenge, right? When you think about increased TB case detection, we clearly need better diagnostics, right? We've been relying on sputum smear microscopy, which is a centuries old technique. It's how Robert Koch first identified mycobacterium tuberculosis as a causative agent of TB you know, more than 150 years ago, and we're still just looking under a microscope to uh, identify sort of TB bacteria and diagnose patients. Um, we also need to increase access, right? Um, you know, there's lots of lots and lots of publications about the catastrophic costs patients go through when they're seeking a TB diagnosis uh, and their inability to sort of access health centers where TB diagnostic and treatment services are offered. And then last, I mean, I think, you know, it's important that we strengthen health systems, right? And so uh, we need to make sure that when people are reaching health centers, they're appropriately screened, diagnosed, and treated for TB. And as you'll see, there are large gaps in, in, in each of these steps. So really, I mean, I think I've tried to sort of focus on sort of emerging these areas together and trying through my research program to uh, work on sort of all of these aspects with the goal of sort of improving sort of case detection and treatment. And so, um, you know, I think as, as a result of that, really, I've focused on sort of translational um, research sort of across the translational spectrum. If you think about the basic kind of um, spectrum of, of research, or it's been described as, you know, moving from basic or developmental research through to efficacy studies, um, and then effectiveness studies in real-world populations, and, and finally, dissemination and implementation studies that look at policy adoption, sustainability, and scale-up. And I've been fortunate to sort of uh, develop a program that sort of incorporates sort of uh, uh, aspects at, at, at each of these steps. So we focused on sort of uh, developing sort of uh, new technology, particularly looking for novel biomarkers of TB and novel platforms to enable sort of point of care, rapid sort of simple TB diagnosis. And then, you know, conducting high quality studies of their diagnostic accuracy and trials to assess their impact. And then last, you know, uh, focusing on sort of guideline and technology sort of implementation. So the project that I'll talk about uh, today is really focused at this at the right end of the spectrum, more on the dissemination and implementation side. Um, uh, and you know, and then I'll at the very end sort of just touch on some of the other projects that are going on in my in my research group. So the story uh, for this project really starts with a new technology. Um, many of you may be familiar with this. It sort of was called Expert MTB RIF, and when it came out, it was kind of you know called a sort of a game changer for for TB. Um, Expert was the first molecular TB test to be endorsed by the WHO in 2010. It's a semi-automated test that detects tuberculosis and rifampin resistance in under two hours with you know, high sensitivity and uh, very high specificity. So right, this compares to sort of sputum smear microscopy where less than half of the cases are detected. So since uh, this was endorsed in 2010, there was you know, significant donor and country investment in the technology with rapid scale up in high burden countries. The graph on the right um, shows the number of modules and cartridges that were just procured uh, in the first sort of five years. And you can see that it's almost kind of a straight line sort of going up. And it really, uh, in the, you know, since from 2015 onwards, this trend has only, only sort of increased and accelerated. The work that I'll be talking about is mainly taking place in Uganda. And so I just wanted to provide a little bit of context uh, in terms of uh, gene expert scale up in, in Uganda. Uh, like in other high burden countries, there's really been a rapid scale up. And I would say Uganda has even been a leader in sort of scaling up this technology. Uh, at the time that um, uh, I made this slide in, originally in 2015, 
There are more than 200 gene expert devices, and they're deployed in, using a hub and spoke model, which is how most countries have deployed this technology. So the red triangles uh, on the map represent sort of these gene expert testing hubs. They're where the devices are. And they're all linked to spokes, which are peripheral health centers, which transport sputum samples to these hubs to be tested. Um, they've procured more than 400,000 uh, expert MTB RIF cartridges at the time. And, you know, there's some, you know, anecdotal evidence that it's having some benefit, right? If you look at case detection, uh, there's been a nearly, there was a nearly fourfold increase in confirmed uh, 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 multidrug resistant TB patients from 2009 before expert int was introduced to 2015, five years afterwards. Uh, during that same period, there was uh, an increase in the total number of TB cases that were notified annually, um, you know, from 40 to 42,000 up, you know, to around 45,000. And, you know, importantly, there was, uh, uh, you know, maybe an increase also in the proportion of cases that were bacteriologically confirmed, meaning that they were treated based on an actual diagnosis rather than empirically or on clinical grounds, increasing from 60 to 65 percent to 70 percent. But there are also a lot of unresolved questions, right, in our mind. Um, how well are these expert referral networks or these hub and spoke models functioning? What's the quality of TB diagnostic care within these referral networks? And what policy changes and co-interventions can further enhance implementation of expert testing and sort of future molecular or point of care tests for TB? So um, we designed a study which we called uh, EXPEL TB, um, which stands for Expert Performance Evaluation to Facilitate Linkage to TB Care. And the aims are, you know, we're been to quantify gaps in TB diagnosis that health centers linked to these expert testing sites to identify modifiable barriers to high quality TB diagnostic services at the provider, patient, and health system level, and then to use that information to develop and evaluate a theory-driven intervention to improve the quality of TB diagnostic services within these uh, referral networks. Um, so the study setting, um, uh, we uh, began working uh, in consultation with the Uganda National TB Program at, at 24 health centers, um, which are the spokes uh, shown in yellow that were linked to uh, gene expert testing uh, sites, which are the hubs uh, shown in the red triangles. These uh, hubs and spokes were selected based on 2015 Uganda TB case notification data, so that there was just enough testing where we can detect the signal, and you know proximity to Kampala, so within six hours of the capital, just for uh, research feasibility purposes. We um, established kind of a really pragmatic um, way of collecting sort of TB evaluation outcome data across these health centers, which we've now replicated at, in many health centers and districts across the country. Um, the data sources that we use are the standard uh, TB registers that are filled out by any health center that does TB testing and treatment. These are required to be uh, filled out by the uh, national TB program and how TB cases get reported to the government and ultimately to the WHO. So these include the presumptive TB register. These are where people who are suspected of having TB based on symptoms or clinical grounds, they get entered into the presumptive register. The TB laboratory register captures uh, patients who uh, provide sputum samples for um, smear microscopy or expert testing. Expert requisition forms, which is what's used to uh, refer samples for expert testing. And then the treatment register, which is where patients who are started on treatment are, are listed and they're followed through uh, to the end of treatment. So what we did is we worked with the health center staff who are not involved in sort of providing TB services. We trained them to sort of take uh, uh, pictures of these data sources every two weeks and to upload them to a secure sort of red cap server. And then our study staff would extract patient level data and match it across the registers and then would call health center staff to resolve queries. So in semi real time, we would sort of get uh, up to date information on all of the the testing treatment uh, that was happening at the health centers. To make sure, because we were focused on expert testing, we used a couple other data sources, including um, uh, the GeneX Alert server, which is how the, the country uh, records all of the, the GeneXpert uh, machines are, are networked or linked to the server to report their testing information. And we also downloaded data directly from the machines to make sure we were capturing all of the expert results. So in terms of the kind of first aim, the quality of TB diagnostic evaluation, this is a study we did in 2017 over the course of a year, looking at all of the health, uh, all of the adults who were undergoing uh, pulmonary TB evaluation, meaning that they were listed in any of these registers or data sources over this year long period. So there were about you know, 6,700 or so adults um, uh, uh, who underwent TB evaluation during the period. 
Um, so the first indicator based on guidelines is that, you know, uh, these patients should be referred for sputum-based TB testing, and only 79% uh, were referred. Um, of those referred, um, only 56% completed the recommended testing, which was getting at least two smear exams or sort of one sort of gene expert or expert test. Um, and then 75% um, of those who were actually diagnosed with TB, so they were either smear or expert positive, were treated within 14 days. So overall, if you were, uh, uh, on average, if you were a patient coming into these uh, into the system, you only had a four, with, and you had TB, you only had a 42% chance of actually getting sort of tested, diagnosed, and sort of treated, which is obviously sort of uh, abysmal. In terms of expert testing, since that's what we're focusing on, um, only 20% of patients were referred for expert testing, including only 33% of HIP positive adults. And you know, people living with for people living with HIV, uh, gene expert really should be the first line test um, for TB. And only a third of these patients were getting uh, getting the test. And then even fewer uh, people without HIV uh, were getting gene expert testing. Um, when expert testing was ordered, it was uh, uh, very uh, it was most often not as the first line test. It was most often done after smear microscopy, resulting in further delays. And then only about half of expert positive patients initiated treatment within 14 days. So I think, you know, the summary for this part of the work is just that, you know, oftentimes in global health, we talk about coverage of services. And Uganda, like many other high burden countries, has achieved, you know, high coverage of expert testing services. But I think what we wanted to emphasize was that, you know, high coverage doesn't really equal high quality care. And coverage is sort of less important to me than sort of providing sort of high quality care. So for the next um, part of our project, um, we wanted to focus on sort of understanding sort of this quality gap. And for this, um, you know, borrowing from implementation science, um, we started with a conceptual model, uh, which in this case was the theory of planned behavior. So we chose this particular theory because um, it, it's been used frequently uh, and there's a lot of empiric, uh, empiric use of it to understand sort of uh, provider level or clinician level sort of behavior change, um, which is sort of what we were after. Um, and so this theory essentially says that, um, you know, the uh, intention uh, to perform a behavior, in this case, follow the international standards for TB care or the guidelines for TB evaluation, um, mediates sort of the actual sort of, you know, behavior, uh, actual performance of the behavior, in this case, guideline adherence. And then intention is mediated by knowledge, skills, attitudes, social norms, and self-efficacy. Because we're working in sort of high burden, sort of low income settings, we also wanted to assess patient factors that might sort of uh, impede uh, guideline adherence, even if clinicians have the intention to follow guidelines. So these include the time and distance for patients to access care and their cost to access care, as well as other health system factors that might uh, impact guideline adherence. And this includes the availability of um, physical and material resources that are ne needed to perform, uh, to perform the behaviors. So ultimately sort of, you know, our hypothesis is that by sort of uh, by improving intention and addressing sort of bar barriers at these levels, we would ultimately improve case detection and treatment. So to uh, inform uh, our understanding of these factors, we kind of conducted a series of mixed method studies. Um, I'm sort of summarizing all of them briefly on this slide, but we, the data collection involved key informant interviews with staff at the six health centers. Um, field observation at all of the health centers, um, just observing the process of patients moving through the TB diagnostic evaluation uh, process. Uh, and then surveys with patients um, at six, a subset of the health centers um, uh, to, to assess sort of their time and cost of accessing care. Uh, we conducted standard sort of qualitative analysis uh, for the interviews, um, including transcribing interviews and field notes and applying standardized coding schemes to identify recurring themes and then really just simple descriptive statistics for the quantitative survey data. Um, so on this slide, I'm sort of summarizing, again, a number of studies that are sort of um, cited at the bottom of the slide. Um, but what we did here was um, um, summarize the barriers to high quality TB evaluation using um, the PROCEED framework, which is another uh, uh, implementation science framework, in this case, used to inform the design of sort of complex interventions. And, the procedure framework essentially says that, you know, successful interventions should target predisposing factors, enabling factors, and reinforcing factors, um, and those are each sort of described on the slide. So in terms of predisposing factors, um, what we noted was, uh, um, particularly from lab staff, was sort of time and resource constraints, 
meaning sort of high workload leading to sort of low self-efficacy that, you know, they actually couldn't complete uh, in a timely manner the, the testing and reporting of results to enable sort of rapid treatment. There's also this persistent belief that TB evaluation is not urgent, right? So if you had a child with a fever, they would rapidly get a malaria test and be you know, started on treatment if they were positive. But with TB, there was the sense that, you know, it's okay, you can ask the patient to come back the next day or the next week. Um, there was nothing really urgent about sort of diagnosing or treating the disease. In terms of enabling factors, um, uh, one that was cited commonly uh, by health workers was that patients would fail to return after their initial visit. If you then look at their cost and time survey data, you would understand why. It would often cost patients, you know, uh, uh, at least their median monthly, uh, monthly household income, if not more than that, to uh, complete a, health, a single health center visit. So asking them to come back multiple times just didn't make sense from a time or cost perspective. Um, in terms of the referral networks themselves, um, even though these networks existed, uh, specimen transport to the expert testing site was inconsistent or often delayed. Um, so a test that only takes two hours sometimes would take two weeks or even a month to get results back to the health center. Um, health workers also cited sort of inability to track and follow up patients, right? So uh, even if they got the results back, once the patient left, they didn't have the means, whether it was airtime for phone calls or uh, a vehicle to sort of conduct tracing in the field, uh, they just didn't have any ability to track and follow up patients. And so one of the quotes that we got uh, related to these were, you know, when they have a cough for more than two weeks, they're sent to the lab, but the problem is they get the first sample and sometimes, actually most times, they don't bring the second sample back. So again, emphasizing that, you know, it's really important to sort of uh, complete testing and facilitate linkage to care at that initial health center visit. And then last, in terms of reinforcing factors, um, you know, uh, a lot of staff cited sort of lack of communication and coordination. Um, so that, you know, many of them didn't, just didn't understand sort of how well or how poorly they were doing in terms of uh, getting patients through this process. And they also had an insufficient oversight um, from the National TB Program, but also from their own sort of leadership within the health center. And so what they, what they would say is things like, actually, at times we have met, but we don't regularly, only when we realize there's a problem, that's when we communicate and say why this is happening, and then we try to rectify. So there's no sense of sort of regular sort of communication or looking at sort of uh, data to understand sort of what's working well and not well. So moving on to sort of AIM-3, um, we wanted to uh, sort of improve this sort of quality gap. And so we went through kind of an intervention design process, which consisted of sort of reviewing evidence for what types of interventions have been studied to address the types of barriers that we wanted to uh, address, consulting with our local, local stakeholders, including community members and community groups, as well as sort of the clinicians and sort of uh, and, and leadership of the Ministry of Health, um, really to understand sort of you know their perceptions about the feasibility of different types of interventions. And working with this kind of stakeholder group, we sort of prioritized which barriers to target, um, identified the interventions that we wanted to test, and then thought about how these interventions could actually be delivered in the context of the health and the primary health centers that we were working in. So the intervention that we came up with was called the uh, Expel TB strategy. Um, you know, compared to sort of 2015 to 17 when we were doing the formative work, one of the new things that came out was uh, kind of more advanced or the next generation molecular testing platforms. So the original testing pl gene expert platforms required sort of battery power um, and they required, you know, kind of an air conditioned environment. Um, but the more recent sort of platforms are, are, are battery powered rather than wall powered. They operate with a, a simple sort of a, a touchscreen sort of interface rather than sort of a laptop or desktop computer. And they're sort of encased in a dust resistant cover so they can operate, uh, you know, outside of a, 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 a sterile sort of laboratory environment. And so we uh, uh, wanted to introduce on-site sort of expert testing instead of sort of this referral based testing to reduce workload and increase the speed and accuracy of testing. We also kind of used borrowed process, um, borrowed kind of uh, interventions from the um, quality improvement. So from the lean method to uh, uh, design kind of a structured clinic process redesign to facilitate same day testing and treatment. What this was, was kind of at each clinic working with the staff to remove some of the inefficiencies that were clearly present in kind of how they move patients through the system. This is really to address the lack of urgency and the failure of patients to return. And last, um, the intervention included sort of regular feedback of quality metrics to health center staff, right? So we just provided a report card 
uh, every month that you know uh, had the same indicators I showed you earlier from our um, uh, our initial research, and the idea, uh, and then taught them sort of how to do simple sort of a PDSA or plan to study act cycles to uh, review the data, uh, discuss sort of what the potential sort of problems might be, you know, come up with potential solutions, and then look at the data again the next month to see if things are improving. And again, the goal here was to improve communication, coordination, and oversight. So um, we uh, uh, were fortunate to get funding to conduct a, a cluster randomized trial of this uh, intervention strategy, um, which was actually just published in the, in the New England Journal last month. And so I'm gonna kind of go over uh, the results. So the objective was to evaluate the effectiveness, implementation, and cost and cost effectiveness of the expel TB strategy at community health centers. And again, the, the, the diagnostic strategy is the multi-component strategy was what I described, on-site molecular testing as the first line test for TB, streamlined clinical laboratory and pharmacy workflows, and then monthly sort of performance feedback. And then routine care um, was uh, sputum smear microscopy as the first line test with referral of, of samples from high-risk patients to these uh, gene expert testing hubs. So this is a cluster randomized trial at 20 community health centers. Um, for those of you who are familiar with implementation science language, it's a type two hybrid effectiveness implementation design, meaning that we're equally focused on understanding effectiveness, but also on documenting uh, uh, and understanding kind of implementation of the intervention strategy. Um, and the population uh, for this uh, study was really all adults who were being evaluated for pulmonary TB uh, during the study period. We only excluded those who had rifampin resistance detected by expert testing um, from the analysis, primarily because those patients are not treated at the health centers. They're referred to higher level facilities for treatment of drug resistant TB. So in terms of trial procedures, um, one of the things that I've learned a lot from is uh, the first time we did a public randomization ceremony. And what I mean by that is that we involve the health center staff in the actual process of randomization. They uh, actually all participated and observed, uh, selected the randomization sequence and numbers. And a lot of this was to get buy-in and to sort of, um, to particularly for a trial, which is studying routine care, you wanna make sure that everyone understands that the process is fair and understands why their, their health centers were assigned to sort of routine versus um, the intervention arms. And uh, it was remarkable actually, I mean, at the end of the ceremony, uh, uh, we kind of did an informal survey and sort of uh, asked uh, participants, particularly those who were randomized to the control arms, sort of how they felt about the process. And you know, I think one of them said, you know, uh, very clearly, you know, this, uh, we don't like it, but it was fair, right? And so they essentially telling us like, we would rather, of course, we'd rather have the intervention um, but, you know, uh, the, the, the process was fair and we understand why it's happening and how it was done. The other features of this trial that I want to highlight um, is kind of, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about sort of pragmatic trials. When you're looking at sort of um, global health research, I mean, you're almost seeing pragmatic attached to sort of uh, the title of every trial. Um, and I think that's sort of oftentimes is sort of a misnomer. In this case, we really wanted to highlight some of the ultra pragmatic features. Here, um, we did the trial under a waiver of informed consent. Um, so particularly when issues like, you know, follow-up, patient follow-up are some of the outcomes that you're interested in, you know, consenting patients sort of changes the relationship between the, the patient and sort of the, the healthcare provider or the researcher. So here, um, we were really trying to study routine and observe routine care. Um, so there was no consent. Um, there was no trial-specific changes to usual care. So we didn't introduce chest x-rays, cultures, or additional patient contact and follow-up as, as has, has often been done in not just TB trials, but you know many trials that are looking at uh, implementation of evidence-based practices. Um, we assessed outcomes using the routine data sources, so the TB registers that I mentioned. We didn't introduce any new systems or um, new sort of tests like culture to assess outcomes. So of course, the limitations are that you know, our data is limited to what's available in registers, but at the same time, you know, we're not adding things that are gonna change um, you know, who gets diagnosed with or treated for TB. And then last, you know, our staff had very minimal contact with the health centers. We didn't have any staff that were based at, at, the, at the health centers that were being studied. We conducted an initial training visit um, and then uh, quarterly site visits to help resolve data queries and conduct some nested sub-studies in, you know, a, a small sub, uh, sub-segment of the, uh, of the population. So in terms of outcomes for the trial, the primary outcome was the number of patients who were treated for uh, microbiologically confirmed TB uh, within 14 days. 
The secondary outcomes really reflect kind of the fidelity of the uh, implementation strategy. We were focused on the numbers who are um, getting tested in accordance with guidelines, the numbers who are getting diagnosed with and treated for confirmed TB, particularly on the same day, because that was the, the goal of the strategy was to enable sort of same day diagnosis and treatment. Um, and so, and then the numbers treated for TB overall, whether it was based on uh, microbiological confirmation or on clinical ground. Um, I've put in here the, the trial flow chart. I know it's sort of hard to read, so I've tried to call out some uh, important aspects of it. Um, so we worked with the, NT, uh, the Uganda National TB Program to identify eligible health centers. So again, these were health centers that were linked to uh, GeneXpert uh, testing hub uh, and that, had, uh, that were seeing at least sort of 20 patients with TB a month uh, and were, um, uh, uh, were within sort of six hours or 150 kilometers from Kampala. So there were overall 84 eligible health centers and we worked with the NTLP to select 20 of them to include in the trial. The target population, again, was all adults who were undergoing TB uh, evaluation and importantly being a pragmatic trial. Um, you know, during the trial period, there were more than 10,000 adults who were actually in this target population and only less than 2% were excluded. And this mostly because we didn't have age, uh, there was missing age information. So we didn't know if they were children or adults. That was the, the vast majority of people who were excluded. And then a few who had rifampin resistant TB in each arm and a couple who had extra pulmonary tuberculosis only. Um, the other thing to note um, from the very bottom uh, uh, rectangles on the slide are that the harmonic mean number of patients was higher in the intervention arm, so 456 versus 366. So this is despite sort of our, um, you know, cluster randomization, uh, including sort of uh, being sort of restricted and stratified. And one of the things that we, we restricted and stratified based on was the size of the health center. So we actually expected, you know, the, the, based on sort of pre-trial data that we collected, um, you know, the, the number of TB patients who were sort of undergoing evaluation was balanced, right, in both arms. But during the trial period, you know, substantially more people were tested for TB in the intervention arm, which, again, I think is an early signal that there was a rapid uptake of the intervention. And one of the things that we actually wanted to do was to get more people tested for TB. So in terms of patient level characteristics, um, you know, uh, the, about 60% of the population in each arm was female, um, which is what you expect for people going to primary health centers in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. The median age was around 40 years. Uh, in terms of HIV prevalence, um, it was about sort of uh, uh, 40 to 45% uh, and similar in, in both of the arms. The prior outcome um, was, again, the, the adults who were treated for confirmed TB within 14 days of presenting to the health center. Um, this is a cluster level analysis using sort of negative binomial regression models. And, you know, uh, we uh, adjusted for the randomization of strata, the number of patients treated for confirmed TB within 14 days, uh, and, yeah, and the number treated within, with, within 14 days uh, in the pretrial period. So during the trial period, there was 342 uh, patients who were diagnosed and treated for confirmed TB within 14 days in the intervention group and 220 in the control group for an adjusted rate ratio of 1.56, or in other words, a 56% increase. So a large increase in the numbers uh, diagnosed and treated for TB rapidly. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, looking at uh, subgroups uh, 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 for the primary outcome, uh, we saw improvement in the numbers diagnosed and treated uh, for both men and women and also for both HIV positive and HIV negative patients, right? So these were the, the main subgroups that we could look at with the data available in the registers. And you see sort of, you know, substantial improvements in the numbers diagnosed and treated for TB across each of these subgroups with no um, statistically significant sort of differences when you look, when you test for interaction. In terms of um, secondary uh, outcomes, uh, again, you know, uh, these are looking at sort of steps along the cascade of care, but also at process metrics that reflect, you know, the intent of the intervention to facilitate same day testing and treatment. And what you see is that, you know, the proportion or the numbers who were tested according to national guidelines uh, improved uh, substantially with an adjusted rate ratio of 1.85. For the same day outcomes, um, you know, the numbers who were received a diagnosis of confirmed TB who were treated for confirmed TB and then treated for any form of TB overall, you know, all sort of improved sort of substantially. 
particularly sort of a you know uh, uh, adjusted rate ratio for those who were treated for confirmed TB on the same day was 2.38. And then for the 14-day outcomes, um, as expected, I mean, you know, some patients do come back, so you see uh, smaller benefits, but still, you know, benefits sort of across the uh, outcomes that we measured. So overall, sort of our conclusion from this was that, you know, there was a uh, really high sort of implementation fidelity in terms of achieving, you know, the goals of the intervention, and then sort of improved quality, not just, um, you know, at the end, but across the entire cascade of care. So last, um, we looked at sort of the cost and incremental cost effectiveness ratio um, for this intervention strategy. If you look at the cost per test, um, you see that it's pretty similar for centralized expert testing, which is kind of the routine care model versus decentralized or on-site testing, which is what the intervention strategy. So both around $20. But then if you look at the cost per patient, it's about twice as high in the, uh, in the intervention arm primarily because many more patients got tested, uh, uh, got expert testing, uh, and therefore um, the cost per patient uh, is, is higher. The incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which is, uh, reflects the cost per additional patient treated for TB within 14 days, was $687, which you know, really compares quite favorably for almost any TB case finding intervention, and even with uh, you know, common interventions like antiretroviral treatment services. So really, uh, you know, quite a low uh, ICER um, suggesting that, you know, both from an epidemiological and economic argument standpoint, this is an intervention that, that, that should be scaled up. On the graph on the right, what you see on the um, x-axis is the cost per additional patient initiating treatment within 14 days, sorry, on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, the annual number of patients presenting for evaluation. And what the green dots are, are sort of uh, different sort of uh, outcomes of different Monte Carlo simulations to look at the relationship between the volume of patients tested and the cost. And you know what you see is that as the volume goes up, you know the cost goes down. And I think you know uh, at even at you know 250 patients tested um, a year, which is you know just you know three to five patients a week, which is you know I think achieved at easily at most uh, even lower level health centers the costs are sort of under $1,000. So really, um, you know, at all but the very smallest health posts, um, this is an intervention that is likely to be sort of cost effective. So some limitations of this uh, trial in particular um, uh, that, you know, we <laughs> went through extensive discussions with the reviewers from the New England Journal about. So one is that, you know, um, Given that we had a relatively small number of clusters, despite the use of stratified and restricted randomization, and just a whole bunch of you know preliminary data that we had, you know about testing volume and HIV prevalence and TB prevalence at these health centers, there could still be an, uh, a potential imbalance um, just due to chance, given the small numbers um, between the intervention and sort of uh, uh, control arm clusters. Um, second, that this was a multifaceted intervention, um, and so. If you're interested in only in the effect of decentralized molecular testing alone, um, you know, we, we looked at this as part of an intervention package. So uh, that question on its own is not answered, which, you know, our response to that was, you know, we, it's uh, ridiculous to expect a test, a technology on its own to address all of the problems that we've documented. And so our use of a multi-component strategy was intentional. And we felt like, you know, it, if others want to try this with just the technology alone, um, be my guest, but really we feel like, you know, it's important to imp not only sort of what we really show with this trial is that technology is one part of the solution, but you also need sort of supportive health system co-interventions to enable sort of effective implementation of a new technology. Um, and last, in terms of generalizability, um, reviewers really wanted to understand like how relevant this was to other settings. And what we sort of said back to them is that, yes, this was done in one country, but really, if you look in the literature, the barriers that we report and that we try to address are commonly found at uh, and reported at uh, health centers in, in many high burden countries. And really, um, you know, there may be components of intervention that need to be adapted in terms of how they're delivered. You know, do you do monthly feedback or biweekly feedback, uh, those kinds of things. But really, uh, you know, as long as the, uh, and this is kind of where the implementation science approach I think is helpful is that if you can document the barriers that you're trying to modify and show that those actual barriers are modified, then where similar barriers exist in other settings, it's reasonable to, to uh, 
assume that the intervention is generalizable or at least to consider trying it to, to see if it, it works in a similar manner. So in terms of conclusions from this work, um, you know, uh, I think I hope I've tried to highlight that you know, scale, scale up of novel diagnostics and I think you know, any new technology alone is unlikely to significantly increase case detection or improve patient outcomes. And here, um, the entire strategy, which included the new technology plus appropriate implementation supports, you know, increased 14-day TB diagnosis and treatment by 56%, and improved quality metrics, you know, along the entire sort of uh, cascade of care. Um, so we've uh, been talking to a lot of national TB programs who've been interested in this work, uh, and there's a lot of support from donors as well to scale up decentralized molecular testing um, to help close the, the TB case detection gap and improve quality of care. And last, I hope I've highlighted our use of implementation science methods and how they can be helpful for designing and evaluating uh, health system interventions to improve quality of care. To kind of circle back to our overall sort of diagnostics research program. Um, so I think, you know, I'm really uh, fortunate to be working with a large number of sort of collaborators across, you know, a large number of projects that we've had funded either primarily through our group or through collaborations with others. Uh, in terms of new technology and platforms, we have a, a, a large uh, R01. Um, uh, one of my co-PIs is sort of Joel Ernst in the Division of Experimental Medicine. Here we're, and we're also working with the Krogan Lab at UCSF, as well as uh, metabolomics groups at Emory, uh, and an uh, industry group looking at sort of uh, 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 bacterial proteins. And what we're trying to do here is really use a comprehensive approach to use state-of-the-art technology to characterize the, the host and bacterial proteins as well as, well as metabolites that are present in uh, blood and urine samples of children who are undergoing TB evaluation to identify sort of novel biomarkers that could be uh, incorporated into new platforms. We also have a project with Global Health Labs really looking at the use of oral swabs, learning from COVID uh, to see if we can uh, process swabs for TB diagnosis instead of sputum, uh, which would you know, simplify the process of specimen collection and testing. And then in that middle category of looking at diagnostic accuracy and impact, we have a, a U01 um, that's looking operating in five countries. So in South Africa, Uganda, and the Gambia, um, uh, in, uh, in Africa, and then uh, the Philippines, India, and Vietnam in Asia. And really, uh, we're looking at over 30 novel diagnostics um, focusing on adults uh, and are partnered with sort of, you know, uh, uh, with industry and with our collaborators in these, in these five or six countries to conduct sort of high quality studies of, of new diagnostics. Um, we have grants that are focused on drug resistance um, and looking at drug resistance diagnostics with um, my colleague Midori Katamaida, and then looking at sort of a breath-based diagnostics with an engineering colleague at the University of Utah. Also delighted to have a number of mentees who've been successful in getting K awards or, um, you know, or pilot grants in these areas. Then still our largest area of, of work is in that guideline and technology implementation phase. In addition to the, the projects I described today, uh, we're doing a lot of work with digital adherence technologies and how we can use them to uh, provide an alternative to directly observed therapy, which is unfortunately still the standard for how uh, patients with TB are treated. And then we have a, 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 with, with, uh, with Luke Davis and David Dowdy, a number of grants looking at um, uh, uh, looking at active case finding and approaches to sort of target, better target active case finding to further sort of enhance sort of case detection. And then, um, you know, my former mentee and now sort of colleague Priya Shete is really interested in the social determinants of, of, of TB. And we have a number of projects with her looking at uh, uh, social protection strategies and how they can sort of uh, 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 enhance sort of the quality of care, quality and outcomes of care. So overall, I'll just end with sort of acknowledging first uh, our amazing team in Uganda who uh, was really responsible for conducting um, uh, a lot of the work that I presented today, uh, along with sort of our collaborators at you know, Hopkins, Yale, um, the Ministry of Health in Uganda and the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And then last, just to thank our entire sort of research group, um, which has really been expanding over the last years to include a number of folks who are now on faculty, um, previously postdoctoral fellows, um, our current postdoctoral trainees, and then our wonderful staff who uh, uh, really deserve a lot of the credit for the analyses and, and oversight of the, the work that we do with our global partners. So I will stop.
stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Dithya. That's uh, that's really terrific. Uh, we're on regular Zoom, so I'm going to invite people just to yell out their questions. Or, you know, we're, come on. Let me ask a, a couple of things to start with. The first question, and these are unrelated, was that the uh, uh, adjusted relative risk for people with HIV infection was 1.78 or 1.79, as I recall. Um, and uh, the question is, is how how did antiretrovirals figure into that? Were you also uh, dispensing antiretrovirals or these people who were picked up at antiretroviral intake, so they were all on ART to start with. How does that? How does that mix? How did how did that work out? Yeah, it's a it's a mix of both. So we, I mean, most of these health centers have a antiretroviral treatment sort of unit or a clinic that operates, you know, several days a week. Um, they definitely conduct TB screening at those clinics, and when patients are uh, you know, identified as, you know, uh, a presumptive TB patient, uh, they ideally get referred um, for testing and, you know, get into the presumptive register, et cetera. So we capture those patients. We don't interfere with their antiretroviral care. And then, of course, there are patients who are newly diagnosed or who don't know they have HIV and um, who also may be screened for TB and, and get diagnosed. So what I would say is that, like, you know, our intervention was not focused on sort of uh, HIV patients in particular or antiretroviral treatment, but, you know, TB screening is certainly an important component of antiretroviral treatment services. And, you know, prior to this, I mean, what we're seeing is that, you know, even in that group who was on antiretroviral therapy, I mean, most of the patients in Uganda at this point are, most of the HIV patients are on antiretroviral therapy. I can go back and look at that, but I would say that at least sort of 70% of the HIV population in the studies on ART. Okay. And despite that, we're seeing, uh, a large improvement in the numbers who are actually treated for TB, diagnosed and treated with TB rapidly. So I think a lot, a large amount of TB being missed in that group, which is why it's not surprising that TB is a leading cause of death um, still, even with COVID, uh, yeah, in, was, people with H, in people with HIV. It was 45% of the, of the patient population, both the control and the uh, intervention arms, right? Something like that. Yeah. So in yeah. The 40s. Um, can I ask you a, a more general question? How do you see uh, UCSF uh, uh, advancing in the field of pandemic preparedness and and response. What's a kind of a larger vision um, do, do you do you have? So, I mean, I think a lot of it is sort of pulling together uh, under an umbrella the uh, you know amazing sort of you know science and technical assistance work that's going on across campus. Um, so we clearly have you know as I've kind of outlined in my research program. I mean, most of these these large public health problems are not sort of going to be solved by you know, a single area of expertise or science, and you need to sort of bring people together. That's what I've tried to do to address sort of a, a particular sort of problem within TB, and I think that would be my overall approach to sort of thinking about pandemic preparedness is, you know, how can we leverage everyone from everything from the outstanding basic science that's going on to, uh, you know, the policy and technical assistance work to inform sort of a, a pandemic pandemic response sort of strategy that um, that brings people together and that sort of creates something that's more than sort of the individual sort of parts. Um, you know, I think I have a strong track record of doing that and that's sort of tried to highlight with some of the work that I do really kind of, you know, even though my own expertise is in implementation science, I maintain sort of an active portfolio of work and, you know, the one of the ones I described were actually doing mouse model work, which I understand nothing about, but uh, understand the importance of doing to, to understand mechanisms and inform sort of new sort of strategies. So I think, you know, what um, maybe, a, uh, it's hard to outline an entire strategy sort of on, on this call, but I think, you know, it has to start with really surveying the, 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 the landscape of work that's going on and fitting it across sort of a, a pandemic preparedness framework to sort of do everything from develop and identify new tools to um, thinking about the appropriate sort of policies and strategies that are needed to deploy those tools and to facilitate sort of uptake, um, clearly to improve communication, which has been a major challenge during this pandemic. Uh, and so I think that, that would be my approach is to really uh, try to sort of bring people together under sort of a common purpose in a way that, um, you know, is responsive to the key elements of any sort of pandemic preparedness plan. Good, thank you. Thank you very much. Please, uh, if you have questions, please just uh, unmute yourself and speak up. And if you don't, I'm going to start calling on people. <laughs> I'm not averse to that. Um, 
Okay. Uh, questions for, for Dr. Katamanchi? Uh, well, okay. Linnea and uh, uh, Linnea's uh, had a question. Um, so just please I, just yell them out. Um, sure, I, I can bring it up. Thanks. Um, so thanks for um, speaking to us, Dr. Aditya. Um, I really enjoyed the part when you brought up the control clinic's concerns, you know, with the trials like this, it is always challenging to balance um, expectations and desires. But, um, you know, if and when the study is over, I'm just curious how you'll address these concerns to make access more equitable for uh, these control clinics, access being to the technologies. Um, I'm a learner, so I'm not sure how it works post-trial, post-study. Well, great. So thank you for that question. First of all, it's really great that you're thinking in that way uh, already. Um, uh, uh, if you say you're a learner, uh, we're all learners. So uh, maybe it doesn't mean that you're earlier in your career, but uh, perhaps uh, that's how I'm interpreting it. But, I, you know, I think for us, you know, we uh, secured, um, you know, a commitment from um, the, the, the donor or from Cepheid in this case, who was providing the devices to when the trial was finished to provide devices for all of the control health centers, which we've now sort of deployed at, at, at all of them. Um, from a design perspective, I think there are also a number of ways that one could potentially address this. And we chose to do kind of a clean sort of cluster randomized trial, but there are waitlist designs and other types of designs where, you know, when this becomes a larger sort of ethical issue or a concern for pragmatic feasibility of implementing a trial and getting stakeholder buy-in, you can, you can deploy to sort of help uh, alleviate sort of some of those concerns. But in this case, I mean, I think, you know, with the support of the national TV program and some of the, the district TV supervisors who, you know, we made the case to the health centers that, listen, like, you know, the program is not going to invest in this technology and it's not going to scale up unless we can really show that it's effective and useful and improve sort of program performance. And so to do that, we think that this is the best design. And we were able to get their buy-in, but like you said, we did you know, uh, uh, let them know, and we did uh, honor our commitment to provide them with these devices once the trial was finished. Very good. Thank you. Um, Mike Reed, uh, did you, you had a question? Yeah. Hi, Aditya. A great presentation. Uh, just curious if you could speak about your your uh, your, your insights into uh, acoustic um uh, epidemiology and the and the role of like AI in TB diagnostics around the the, the 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 acoustics of TB cough. I know that you've done some research, so I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I um, I'm almost it's almost like I planted you with that question. So it's one one of my favorite sort of new uh, new topics. Um, we uh, have become you know very interested in sort of um, you know uh, cough science or sort of acoustic epidemiology, as sort of Mike uh, described it. You know, cough is clearly a cardinal feature of um, many respiratory diseases. Uh, to date, it's been very kind of a subjective assessment of cough. You know, we ask patients or individuals sort of, are you coughing and is your cough better or worse? Um, there's really no objective way of quantifying, you know, uh, either the burden of cough, how it's changing over time, its spatial relationships with, you know, uh, where you go to work or other activities that you might be doing. Um, and, you know, uh, and so I think with, uh, things like mobile phones and their ability to sort of detect and record sort of cough sounds, and then the use of sort of machine learning and AI to sort of classify sort of sounds as being cough or not. There are now sort of a number of apps uh, that can actually do that, right? And so there's one that we've been particularly working with from a company called Hyfe um, uh, that uh, is just a, an easy tool to use. Um, we're collecting lots of data on that from our uh, adult sort of cohorts in the five countries that I mentioned. Um, and we're interested in using them in, in two ways in TB. So one is, you know, when you record sort of baseline cough sounds for patients who are coming in for TB evaluation, can you, are there acoustic features of that cough, both which are, you know, within the human range of hearing and above and below it that might inform whether that's a TB related cough or not. So this is kind of using kind of um, the acoustic features of cough as a triage test, right? Similar to how you might use an X-ray. Um, at the same time, you know, we are also sending patients home with a smartphone and having them record cough over time. And here you can think about uh, cough uh, being sort of a signal for adherence to TB medications for those who are on TB treatment or as a way of measuring using a patient reported outcome for quantifying kind of how treatment improves the burden of cough. We're in discussion with a number of sort of TB trialists for, for incorporating this into new TB trials, but, uh, trials of new TB regimens to see 
how they impact, for example, like the burden of cost. And I have a postdoc in my group, uh, Sophie, who's um, become really interested in using these tools to quantify kind of the burden of post-TB lung disease and try to identify which patients might be at risk for developing post-TB lung disease. Um, I think these tools are going to have a lot of use beyond. Uh, in fact, the majority of their use is going to be outside of TB. Um, for COVID, uh, you know, there are groups um, in Spain who are who've deployed this in sort of entire communities and have shown some really interesting data already uh, around uh, showing that you know they they send people symptom surveys as well as record their um, daily as well as record their cough sounds. So patients tend to start or not patients community individuals members start tend to start coughing. Um, much before they actually notice or report that they have cough as a symptom. So redefining kind of what we talk about as asymptomatic sort of disease. Um, and they've also started to show correlations between kind of increasing cough counts with, you know, surges, right? Similar to what you're using to say, you know, the, the stool testing and cycle thresholds to look at sort of uh, predict surges. So I think uh, we were, uh, we've been talking with Mark Pletcher for a long time about sort of incorporating some of this into his citizen science study uh, as a way of sort of collecting some of this data in our communities that hasn't happened yet for a variety of reasons. Um, and then, you know, we have folks who are interested in this for, you know, for many things, like you think about diseases like asthma and COPD, where you have high, high uh, re-hospitalization rates after discharge. Um, and can you use this, for example, in COPD patients to monitor their symptoms objectively uh, after their discharge from the hospital? And can that be used to predict, um, you know, which patients might become re-hospitalized? Um, so I think there are a lot of uh, potential uses of this that are yet uh, unexplored. Um, I'm as interested in kind of the kind of the relationships of cough over time and duration and place as, as I am around the acoustic features, which I think that's more sort of pie in the sky. You know, can you really distinguish a TB cough from a pneumonia cough or, or something else? Um, you know, I think you might be able to with reasonable specificity. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect. It might be good enough as a triage test. Um, but uh, that's something we're exploring, but I think some of the longitudinal uh, monitoring um, applications to me are really interesting. Thank you so much. That's fascinating. I had uh, I had no idea. I thought you were going to talk about you know they they cough and you'd see if there was blood or something. You know, I thought it was going to be even even more uh, even more straightforward. But uh, that's fascinating stuff. Thanks for the question, Mike. Well, we're at the witching hour. Um, thank you so much for uh, for coming on. It's been a real pleasure. Um, and uh, we all look forward to, to working with you in the, uh, in the future, um, uh, at least through the TB Center, if not, uh, if not even more closely. So thanks a lot, Adithya. And thank you all for getting on. Big, big crowd for a Monday afternoon. Take care, yeah, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.